All right, we're going to get started here with chapter 9, Linear Momentum and Collisions. So a little history on this. Uh, this idea of momentum was originally thought up by uh, Isaac Newton. However, he thought it was kinetic energy. Uh, it wasn't till somebody came along named Emily de Chatelet that uh, argued with him and said no, that kinetic energy should be related to the velocity squared. Uh, she took a lot of heat for this because uh, you, you know you weren't supposed to disagree with the great Newton, uh, but eventually experiments came along that showed that uh, it was correct. It should be according to velocity squared and not just velocity. However, uh, it was already found that this was very useful, and uh, it was so it, it hung on as another idea called momentum uh, that that we can still take advantage of and use today. So the things we're going to cover here are linear momentum. Uh, momentum and Newton's second law, impulse, conservation of linear momentum, inelastic collisions, elastic collisions, center of mass, which we're only going to kind of show you the final result of today. Um, and when we do torque later, I'll explain why the equations I gave you here today uh, work. Systems uh, then with changing mass, like a rocket propulsion or something like that. So let's take a look here and define momentum. So momentum uh, is uh, written with a lowercase letter p. Uh, this is having something to do with the original language it was developed in where it had a p as, its an as, as what stood for momentum, for what it was called. But it's a vector, uh, so we're back to vectors, and it is simply the mass of the object, which is a scalar, times the velocity of the object, which is a vector. Uh, this results in an FI, SI unit of a kilogram from the meters and a meter per second from the velocity. So you have a kilogram meter per second. Uh, be sure to remember that this is a vector uh, and has direction. Uh, and the, direct, the direction of the velocity is the same. Uh, the direction of the momentum is the same as the direction of the velocity. Okay, But this idea of it having a direction is extremely important. And if you forget consider the direction it can end up getting you can end up getting problems very wrong so take a look here uh, we can talk about the change in momentum if we assume these two things have the same momentum they have the same mass and velocity as they fall down uh, the soft teddy bear hits the ground and just stops right there and so therefore its change in momentum is just to lose the momentum that it had so mv However, if we have this ball that bounces without losing any velocity, this is a very important idea here. If it bounces back up with the same velocity that it hit with, then uh, we have a change in momentum of 2 mv because the momentum before, so if we do change in momentum, the momentum final minus momentum initial, well, the final momentum is an upwards mv, and the initial momentum then was a downward mv, and that ends up giving us mv plus mv, which is 2mv. All right, so that's a very important thing when you have something that like hits a wall and bounces off at the same speed that you have to remember that in one direction it had positive uh, momentum, and in the other direction it had a negative momentum. Uh, here, momentum and Newton's second law. So. We're used to Newton's second law being F equals ma. However, that really only works uh, when you have constant mass, and it also doesn't work in other things uh, like quantum mechanics and stuff where you can't exactly define these things. So we have another version of Newton's second law here, which is F equals uh, the change in momentum over time. Uh, you can kind of get this by taking a look at here and saying, well, this is mass times change in velocity over change in time because that's what acceleration is right and so if we just group together the mass times change in velocity then over time well mass time change in velocity is just change in momentum over change in time so we can kind of get that that way it's not a perfect derivation but you can see that we end up with this delta p over delta t even just from that and so sometimes that's a lot easier to deal with uh, in these kinds of problems. So in other words, Newton's second law says that force, net force is the rate of change of momentum.
Uh, next, we're going to define impulse, um, and we're going to define that as the average force times the time over which that force is applied, and that'll be called impulse. The units for this is a newton second, a newton coming from the force and a second coming from the time. And notice this, that a newton second becomes a kilogram meter per second. And so if you remember back a couple pages here, where was it? This is a kilogram meter per second. So immediately we should see that this is gonna have some sort of relation to uh, momentum. And it turns out if you, if you go over here and take a look, that if we start with our second law there, that uh, average force is the rate of change of momentum, you can multiply both sides by t, and then you get momentum is force average times time, which is exactly the same thing that we defined impulse to be. So in other words, what we're saying is ultimately that impulse is just a change in momentum, just like that. All right, that's it. That's what impulse ultimately turns out to be. There's uh, nothing really that you have to do about this. And notice that this impulse is just a change in momentum that when, by the time we get to this step, there's no time dependence in there, okay? There's nothing in there talking about how long it took for that change in momentum to take place. We're only interested in how long the, or, or what the total change in momentum was, okay? And that leads us to this idea here, that you can get the same change in momentum by a large force acting on a short time or by a smaller force acting on a longer time. So if you look at this, if we go back this page, we can say, we can get the same change in impulse, right, is our force times delta T, our force average. It's how, if, if, we, if we increase the time on which the force is acting, we can decrease the time for which or we can decrease the, the force with which we need to create that same impulse. And conversely, if we increase the force to get the same change in momentum, we don't need to do it for as long of a time. So if we think about, like, say, propulsion or something like that, uh, you can have a small amount of force acting over a very long time to get a very large change in impulse, or you can just you know, have a great big force acting all at once and in a very short time to get a big change in impulse. All right, it's, it's just one of those two things. Uh, the net force acting on an object is the rate of change of its momentum. So if you look at net force, it's this rate of change of momentum, which is what I was just saying. Uh, if the net force here, you need to act on, look at this, if the net force acting on an object is zero, its momentum is conserved, all right? That is, momentum final equals momentum initial. And if, uh, when is this going to apply? This is basically gonna apply any time we're considering all the objects that are interacting, the, momen the momentum of all the objects that are interacting, or we consider them all our system, then momentum is always conserved in that case, okay? So let's take a look at this. This is what I was just talking about. Internal forces versus external forces. Internal forces act between objects within the system. Uh, external forces would be an object outside the system acting on it. As with all forces, they occur in an action-reaction pair. And then if we're counting all the forces on all of them, then the internal forces has to totally and necessarily sum up to zero. All right, that means that the net force acting internally on something is zero, and then therefore the total net force acting on something has to be purely from external forces. This is that same idea we talked about when we were talking about Newton's laws a while back, that you can't like reach down, grab yourself by the feet, and pull yourself up into the air, okay? It has to be external forces to give you an acceleration to change uh, your velocity which would be a change in momentum. All right, uh, if we do consider all of the objects that are interacting as all being part of the system, then we can, con we can conserve uh, linear momentum, okay? And so the conservation of momentum for a system is this basic equation here. It's all the different objects. You have object one, two, three, four, five, whatever it is. And then 
uh, you have all the sum of all the final momentums of each object is going to equal the sum of all the initial momentums of each object. Now, this, I guess we could put more simply as a sum of momentum finals has to equal the sum of all your initial momentums, like that. And if we do that, uh, and we consider all the objects that are interacting, nothing external, we're not leaving anything out, then those two things will be equal to each other, okay? Uh, that doesn't mean that the momentum of the first object is the same at the beginning and the end. It just means the sum of all the momentums is the same. So different components may change, but the total when you add them all up uh, will not change. It'll stay equal to each other. Okay? So we could take a look here. If we had these, these two things going on here with uh, these two canoes, I think we did a problem kind of similar, similar to this in the back. Um, the only way for one of the people in one of the canoes to push, say, canoe two to the right is going to end up with canoe one going to the left. And in fact, uh, if they're both just sitting there and they're perfectly stationary, then their initial total momentum is zero. And what you'd end up with is like a momentum two final and a momentum one final, right? We'd end up with this idea that we have zero momentum initial has to equal uh, P2F plus P1F, which means that P2F is equal to negative P1F. So in other words, the only way to get object two to go to the right is to make object one go to the left. They have to go in opposite directions and then that total momentum still adds up to being zero. Uh, it's old, uh, a line from a movie is that the, the only way humans ever figured out to go somewhere was to leave something behind. So if you wanna go to the right, you gotta make something else go to the left. You gotta make something go in the opposite direction. Now, usually we're pushing on Earth, like as we walk around on the ground and stuff, and so a change in Earth momentum is, you know, f from us, so very small that it doesn't actually like it is not noticeable to us at all that it, we have changed the like the rotation of the planet because it's so minuscule uh, compared to how much our velocity changes the velocity of earth is is barely anything but technically if you're going to jump up in the air you have to push earth down um, it's just that it's going to hardly move at all because its mass is so huge comparatively to your mass, like you're doing your momentum, uh, you have a big change in velocity with a very little mass, and it has a giant mass, and therefore barely any change in velocity, but they equal each other. Uh, here we can start talking about collisions. This one was more about recoiling, like you have zero momentum at the beginning, and then there's the recoil, as they one goes one way and the other goes the other way. Uh, this is what happens if you have two objects that at least one of them is already moving and they collide. Uh, we assume that the time of collision is short enough that we can ignore uh, any of those kinds of things, any of those external forces that may have come in through that. Um, and the first kind of uh, collision here is this inelastic collision, all right? I think of this as means it's not elastic, inelastic. That means these two objects are not bouncy. And so the idea is that when they hit, they at least stick together somewhat. And the ones we typically go with are usually called either completely inelastic or sometimes called perfectly inelastic collisions where the objects hit and they stick together. Now here, momentum would be conserved, but total energy, total kinetic energy is not conserved. So imagine if we had a clump of clay and another clump of clay, both with the same exact mass, both hurtling towards each other at the same velocity or the same speed, V and V, and they have both have the same mass M, and these two clumps of clay then hit in the middle and they form one bigger clump of clay, which is two times the mass of each of them because they clump and they stick together, you know, how fast would that clump of clay be moving in the middle? And the answer, at least intuitively, should be to you that its velocity has to be zero. So these initial velocities, 
that were the same have to then clump and stick together. So then when we look at this, the momentum is conserved because the initial momentum of this is the exact equal but opposite to the initial momentum of that one because they have the same mass, the same speed, they're just in different directions. And then the total, so the total momentum initially is zero and the total momentum at the final is zero. However, before the collision, this has kinetic energy and this has kinetic energy, but this has, uh, has no kinetic energy. And so we started off with something where we had kinetic energy and we ended with something where we didn't have kinetic energy, uh, which means that kinetic energy had to go somewhere if we're assuming we didn't have any like changes in height, it didn't become potential or anything like that. And so if you think about it, you know, we want to pause it for a second and think before I tell you, where does that energy go to? And the answer is heat. And so if you've ever done any work, like with a hammer and a nail, if you hammer in that nail, um, you know, you swing that hammer, it has momentum, it hits the nail, and even when you get it all the way down where the nail's not moving anymore, if you keep hitting it, what happens is, and you can, you can actually burn yourself with this, is the nail will get hot and it'll get warm uh, because it's changing all of that energy uh, into heat and heating the object up. All right, so here's an example of a completely inelastic collision. This could be like two train cars where they one is moving and one is not, and they hit, and then they stick together, and then they move together as one object afterwards. So if we look at the math for that, what we can say is that we're, we're going to go with the whole idea that the, uh, the total initial momentum has to equal the total final momentum, and this is the total initial momentum, and this is the total final momentum, and so they then have to equal each other. So these have to be the same, all right? Because we have no external forces, just the forces between those two. We're assuming it's a frictionless track here. Uh, if that is the case, you can then solve for, uh, if you look at this, they have the exact same final velocity because once they stick together, they're moving with that same final velocity. So we can write this this way. Um, if you don't like that, you can also, you could have started with that it was M, 1 VF plus M2 VF and then factor out that VF and you get that result right there. And so if you solve for the final velocity, uh, you end up getting a result like this. I'm not suggesting that you write down that result. I'm suggesting that you remember this and then you remember how to just go in and write the momentum of each initial and final, and then you can always just solve for that. Um, because sometimes you might not, you, you may be given an initial velocity and a final velocity, and you're asked to figure out what one of the masses was or something like that. And so you're not always gonna be using just this result right here. Um, so I tend to just wanna remember what, that momentum is mv and that my momentum is conserved, right? As long as we're considering only internal forces and there's no external forces, then the momentum is always conserved. And uh, in fact, momentum is always conserved if you just go ahead and, you know, if you have a situation where you're not including the external forces, just include them in your system, and then suddenly again, momentum is all is conserved again. All right, here, another example of an inelastic collision is a ballistic pendulum. This is a very classic experiment. Um, what you have to do is actually solve this in multiple parts. The first part is that uh, you have a momentum collision occurring where you have the momentum of this mass uh, being non-zero and the momentum of this mass being zero, and then they have an inelastic collision. And it's during this inelastic collision that energy is lost, okay? So because of that energy lost, you know, it's gonna create some heat, this does not swing up all the way as high as if you were to just say, you, in other words, you can't do this all with, uh, with conservation of mechanical energy because in this collision, mechanical energy is not conserved. So what you have to do is you do this first part as a conservation of momentum. Then you figure out what the final velocity is of the two together and then do conservation of energy to see how high it goes. So you have to start with a conservation of momentum 
just for the collision and then switch to a conservation of energy after the collision. You cannot just go conservation of energy from all the way over here to all the way over here because of the inelastic collision means we're losing kinetic energy, that kinetic energy is not conserved. So you can't go straight and just say, well, I have this amount of kinetic energy here, that's how much potential energy I should have here. That's gonna get you the wrong answer. You have to go and say, all right, I have this amount of momentum here, and then that's gonna give me the same amount of momentum right here once they collide, and then use that momentum to calculate this final velocity use that final velocity to calculate kinetic energy and then use that kinetic energy to calculate the potential energy up here to see how high it goes. But what's usually done with this is you fire this object and you don't know its speed and so you look and see how high this goes, calculate the potential energy, say that's how much kinetic energy it had after the collision, and then by looking at the two masses you then figure out what that velocity was. And so you can figure out like um, like if you're investigating something or whatever, you can figure out how, how fast the projectile was fired from a gun or something like that with this ballistic pendulum idea. All right, if you're doing inelastic collisions in two dimensions, uh, you have to conserve momentum along both X and Y directions. So if you have uh, this object with momentum in the, X, in the Y direction and this one with momentum in the, y, in the X direction and this one in the Y direction, when they hit, you're going to get momentum in both directions. All right, they're going to go off at an angle. But you have to then do conservation. So in other words, net momentum initial in the X direction has to equal net momentum uh, final in the X direction and net momentum initial in the Y direction has to equal net momentum final in the y direction. So you just have to do conservation in both directions. All right, and that's going to involve, you know, messing with your vectors and paying attention to the angle that they go off with after they stick together uh, and everything like that. Okay, and so you're conserving it in multiple directions in both the x and y direction. And if it was three dimensional, you'd have to conserve it in the z direction as well. Uh, here we're going to talk about elastic collisions, and I like this one because it's the word elastic makes it sound like it's bouncy. So these are objects that are not going to stick together. A good example of this is, uh, you know, billiards playing pool. You hit one ball over and it hits another, and they all bounce off in their other directions, and uh, they don't stick together. And very little energy is lost in these collisions. So if we have a perfectly elastic collision we can conserve both kinetic energy and momentum. And if we can't, then it becomes very difficult to solve. But we can conserve both of them. So in this situation, our, moment, our net momentum initial equals our net momentum final, and our mechanical energy initial equals our mechanical energy final. So we get that conserved uh, for both of them. And in fact, you would need both of them to figure these out because unlike in the inelastic ones, after the collision occurs, you have two velocities, two different velocities instead of just one. And so if you try to solve this with just momentum, you're typically gonna end up with two unknowns instead of one, and so you need another relation in order to uh, figure out that last unknown, and you can do that with the conservation of uh, mechanical energy, which is gonna just ultimately be, if we're, if we're doing this on a flat plane, it's gonna just be, conservation of kinetic energy okay in most of the ones that we're going to do like that all right and so you can go through and solve these out um, if your two objects have the same mass what ultimately results if you have a a an elastic collision like this one dimensional where there's no angle going off is they simply swap velocities uh, this is example in that thing if you've ever seen it it's called newton's cradle we have all the, the balls hanging down that all just touch each other like this, the, like the metal spheres. And then you pick one up and you let it fall down. And when it hits over here, then just one over here goes off. And if you pick, if you instead pick, you know, two of them up and drop two of them, then when they hit the two stick and then these other two over here will go up together. And so, you know, it'll go back and forth like that. If, you, if you've never seen one of those, ask me and, you know, you know we'll, we'll take a look at one but or look one up online and see the way that it works. But um, 
it is it does work that way where however many you let go and hit over here is how many are going to leave off of the other side because all of these have the same mass and so it's just a simple exchange if you play pool and you hit a ball dead straight on with another ball uh, then they just simply uh, swap velocities and one of them stops and the other keeps starts going okay so that that'll happen if the masses are the same if the masses are not the same then you end up with both of them moving um, they could be moving in the same directions or opposite directions depending on what their velocities were before um, but uh, there you're not just swapping velocities you have to actually go through and do all the calculations uh, here we can see what is derived from starting with this idea right here that initial momentum equals final momentum if that's the case we can actually go through and solve for these and then you can include the other so what you would do is uh, you'd end up with something like m1 v1 initial plus m2 v2 initial equals i need a little more room than that equals uh, M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. So that would be like if it was just two objects, that would be your conservation of momentum. And then if you go for conservation of kinetic energy, it's one half M1 V1 initial squared plus one half M2 V2 initial squared equals one half M1 V1 final squared plus one half m2 v2 final squared and then you'll notice all the one halves can cancel so you don't even need to have those in there and so uh, this is my recommendation is knowing how to write those down just based off conservation of energy and conservation of momentum and then you can combine them together to eliminate one so if i were to take uh, say i were to take this first equation and solve it for v1 final and then solve, plug it into the other one, then I would be left with an equation that would help me solve for V2 final. Okay, so you can basically derive these, these two here from what I just wrote out there without having to memorize them. But if you're good at using them, uh, you can write them down and do that as well. Uh, Two-dimensional collisions have, you have to have a little extra knowledge at the end. Um, so you have to have some of the final information. You can't just have all the initial information and solve it because you end up with too many unknowns. You have to know uh, what angle they bounce off each other at or what some of the final velocities are or something like that in, in what direction and everything like that in order to solve uh, for what this happens. Because you can imagine uh, if you're playing something like this here, uh, curling you could you can imagine that depending upon what angle they hit at you know like did the circles hit or the stones hit straight on in which case one goes straight and the other stops or did they hit at a slight angle where this one was coming this way and then suddenly you know this one bounces off that way and that one bounces off this way at different angles and then depending on what angle they hit with each other uh can very very much change uh, what your outcome is there so you can't just know like the initial speed and momentum of of the two objects and be able to figure it out you have to know angles or final velocities and things like that to or in order to do that here uh, i want you to kind of accept this for the moment and then when we get going into torque i will come back later and and explain to you uh, where the equations we're about to talk about come from but basically the center of mass is the point where a system can be balanced in a uniform gravitational field. So if you had a large mass at one end of a rod and a smaller mass at the other, in order to balance it, you would have to be closer to the larger mass. If the two masses were identical, then you'd be right in between the two masses. And then if the other, you know, again, this one, the larger mass you have to be closer to. Uh, you can think of this as like being on a seesaw, it works really well when you're like this and it's right in the middle. Uh, seesaws don't work so well because uh, when one person is much, much larger than the other, they have to, have to, they have to push themselves up uh, a lot because it's balanced here in the middle and it's not going to work as well because you're not balanced. You're not you know, supporting it at the center of mass. Uh, here are the equations for it. Again, I expect you 
to just accept them at the moment, where xcm is the, the position of the center of mass, x1 is the position of the, one of the masses, and x2 is the position of the other, and then m1 and m2 are their corresponding masses. And then, of course, over here, we're just saying this capital M is M1 plus M2, so total mass right there. Um, and again, this will turn out to give you that the center of mass is closer to the more massive object when you do this. All right, uh, so accept these, use these. Later on, I'll show you how they get derived. Uh, the center of mass of an object does not have to be actually within the object. Uh, it can be outside of it. So if you're looking at a book, it's probably within it. If you're looking at a bowling ball, it's probably within it. If you're looking at something like an inner tube, the center of mass is in the middle of it, but it's not actually inside the object. So it's external to the object. So the center of mass doesn't actually have to be inside of the, uh, like within the physical parts, the matter of the object. It can be external to it. Uh, here we can take a look at the motion of the center of mass. Uh, here we're just comparing uh, ultimately what ends up being the, you know, the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass equals all the sums of m2v2 dot dot dot. All right, that's what this is basically telling us is the, the momentum of the center of mass is the same as the sum of all the momentums of each individual particle. And the same thing over here. The force on the center of mass, all together as one, the total, is equal to the sum of the individual forces. Like that. And so you end up with having these two equations there for, we're just dividing both sides by the total mass, for the, uh, total velocity of the center of mass and the total acceleration of the center of mass. And so uh, to, to illustrate this for you, take a look here at uh, this, uh, this example here in this picture, which is like a fireworks. So if you shoot the firework off, uh, the, the motion of the center of all the masses as it explodes up is the same as what would happen if the rocket didn't explode. So if the rocket didn't explode and you fired it off and it would just follow this parabolic path, right? Um, it would follow that, that parabolic path of a projectile, right? But it explodes. And what happens, though, is if at any moment you go through and take all these masses and use those equations to calculate where the center of mass is, it's always going to lie along the parabola that would have been followed had it not blown up, okay? And it's the same thing. If you throw something that's maybe heavier at one end and then a small mass at the other. Say we had a stick or something like this that had a heavy end, heavy mass at one end and a, heavy, and a light mass at the other end, and you throw it, what's gonna happen is, say your center of mass is here, it's gonna make a nice parabolic path. But as this thing spins around, right, your large mass over here, it's, it's the center of mass that's gonna stay uh, at going along that path, you know, where, but it's going to look really wonky. It's going to look like it's flobbling all over the place. Like if you've ever thrown like a, like a ball that has, you know, uh, they used to make those balls that it was like a ball inside of a ball. And so they were off center. So that, you know, one side was heavier than the other and you'd kick it and it goes kind of wobbling all over the place. Uh, this is going to look like it's wobbling all over the place and it's not going in a parabola. But if you, you know, marked on their stick like a little, you know, with a little piece of tape or something where the center of mass was, the center of mass would follow out that parabolic path, okay? Even, you know, as it rotates and flips, that's what's going to follow the parabolic path. And then the same thing here. Every point you go to, you calculate back the center of mass of all the individual parts as they keep spreading out. Still, that center of mass stays on that projectile path, okay? And so we can then just go ahead and say uh, Newton's second law for the entire system of particles, the entire system of objects, rather than uh, you know each individual one. We can still have this uh, f equals ma and still have these parabolic paths. All right, if you have a system with changing mass, uh, we would look more at how much the mass changes versus the momentum. So this could be something like, 
you have a train car that's open, right? That's open and it's sliding down with some velocity V here um, initial on this frictionless track, but it's raining and the rainwater is going straight into it. So the rainwater is falling straight down, which means it has no horizontal effect on the, it has no effect on the horizontal momentum. And then the question might be, if it starts out empty, you know, what's its speed once it's halfway full of water? Okay, so there the mass is changing, which is going to end up changing uh, the velocity at the end. Uh, we can also think of this as thrust. So if you say, have a rocket engine, right? And the rocket engine, you have some fuel in your rocket, you know, whatever it is in here, some fuel. Uh, you burn that fuel up and give it a very high velocity going that way. And then as you burn that fuel up, you end up with less and less of the fuel. It keeps going away, which means the mass of your rocket is getting lighter and lighter because that fuel is being left behind, whereas uh, then the rocket is going this way faster and faster. And so you can get a thrust force from this. Uh, if you think about all the momentums of all the particles that are shot out over here and the momentum of this rocket, if it's, you know, we're doing this in outer space, it's the only forces, then the center of mass that we started with, say the center of mass of the rocket was right here. If you traced all the little gas particles and everything back and the rocket itself and chased all their momentums and summed them all up, or not their momentum, their center of masses, and you, you added it up and found the center of mass of the whole thing, it would be in the exact same place as when you started firing the rocket. If you accounted for everything in it, every bit of uh, gas and all the little particles and stuff that you shoot out in the opposite direction. So again, the only way to go to the right is to push something to the left. If you were floating in outer space and you had nothing to push off of, you know, and you needed to get over so, so maybe this is your space station over here and you're here and you're like, uh-oh, I'm floating in outer space. Um, I don't I don't care how far, you know, if, even if it's not very far, you can't get yourself over there uh, without sending something in the opposite direction. So you better have something to throw. You better have like a wrench or something that you were using to work with that you could then throw in that direction in order to give yourself a little velocity this way in order to make it back to your spaceship. Okay, because if you have nothing to throw and nothing to get rid of, nothing to leave behind, you're not going to make it back over to the spaceship. You can't. There's nothing you can do to do that. All right, here's our summary. Uh, you can look through this. It's just all the stuff we talked about um, and some key ideas you need to make sure you remember. Uh, what I will do is also make a video talking about... Uh, the problems, the, the, the example problems going around with chapter nine, and you can look through those and watch that to see, uh, you know, a lot of this in use in example problems. Okay, uh, I think that's gonna pretty much be it. Just this summary with these different equations and things that you would use that we talked about. And uh, that's about all, thanks.